All right, um, Dan, thanks so much for uh, speaking with me here today. Thanks for introducing me. For sure. Um, so I, I came across your article on Growth Mentor and just for uh, folks, a little bit of context, Growth Mentor is this really awesome platform that you can basically go on and uh, book time with growth professionals. So um, I've been a, a part of Growth Mentor for a little bit longer than a year now. And I've talked with folks in product, in engineering, um, in, in marketing, in copy. Um, it's been really cool just to be able to, to connect with folks. And we'll be talking today specifically about your article, Your First 90 Days as a Growth Marketer. Um, and I'll link it in the, in the YouTube in the, in the description for people to read if they want. Um, but before we do that, I'd love if you could just give me like a high level background of, of yourself and, and what you've been up to. Sure. Um, so I am a freelance growth marketer. I'm developing an agency at the moment called WeScaleStartups.com. Um, and my background comes from working as uh, user acquisition and CMO in various different startups, including a Series A and a Series B. Um, after that, I left and I worked on a bunch of contracts, which was really good fun. I was also mentoring, and I still am a mentor on Google's Launchpad Accelerator program, which is super fun because you get to mentor startups around the world and like face different types of challenges in different, uh, you know, startup verticals. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. We've got a few really fun clients and um, I am a bit too enthusiastic about marketing. I think I annoy my girlfriend and friends about that. <laughs> uh, I definitely can empathize with that. Um, I do have a couple marketing buddies that I will like talk about campaign optimizations, A-B testing, good creative. But then some of my friends, I'm like really excited about it. And they're like, dude, I don't care. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, but okay, so, so your first 90 days as a growth marketer. Um, this was a, a great article that you wrote. You basically broke it into the first seven days, your first week, um, your first 30 days, your first month, and then the, the first 90 days, basically your, your first quarter as a growth marketer. Um, before we get into the content, like what were your, what were your thoughts or reasons behind uh, writing the article? Um, so essentially I found that I'm the kind of person that wants to do everything at once. I want to launch all the campaigns. I want everything to be live uh, on day one. Now that's not really realistic uh, because any good campaign goes into user research and like message testing and all this kind of stuff. Um, so what I did was create a to-do list for myself of like what are the most important priorities to set the fundamentals in order to support these marketing campaigns. And I basically just expanded on that process and had some like random thoughts about what I feel is important where, because otherwise what happens is you, well, I half ass all of the things and I don't finish, uh, I don't finish them all in a linear fashion, which actually reduces the speed at which I can go to the market. Makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting things for me just like diving deeper into the world of of growth marketing and just um you know company growth more more broadly is just the fact that a lot of every great growth marketer has a very systematic way of thinking um and a very linear path that they're they're trying to kind of going towards um and it's something that i think is super necessary specifically today where there's just an overabundance of data and overabundance of information. It's very easy to do a lot of things and launch a lot of campaigns. So having a very um, systematic and, and thoughtful process behind what you do, I think makes sense. Um, and this article, Your First 90 Days as a Growth Marketer, this could apply to also, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of other jobs, um, you know, simply because it, there is, Having a plan for your first uh, quarter or first time in a new job um, definitely can bring some of the stress off of like feeling overwhelmed. So let's go into the, the first seven days, the, your first week. Um, the two things you kind of talk about really getting accomplished here is collaborating with people and, and also like getting tooling set up. Um, I think those are two, two important distinct things. Um, but first, like talk about, talk about the, the people and how you think about collaborating and, and getting to know folks in that first week. So I think one of the most common issues is that people, um, people face when they starting it as a growth mentor or in fact a growth marketer, or in fact, pretty much any role in a startup is 
um, they have certain expectations of how communication is done, how work process is done, um, but they don't uh, explain them. Uh, this is definitely a problem I've faced. And what I found was that actually just taking dedicated time out to speak to each individual member of the startup that you'll be interacting with and any other regular stakeholders, uh, such as like investors that are act actively participating in the growth and talk to them about what are their expectations for a growth marketer, what uh, they're looking to get out of it, how they communicate is super important. Um, because all this information allows you to adapt your process slightly and just get things done a lot faster. And it's really difficult because there's less frameworks than there is for marketing. Um, but I feel like, <laughs> sorry about that. I feel no like that this is a really important aspect that is underlooked. And if we dedicate time, we will have an easier rest of 90 days. What are some inefficiencies that, and you've been at multiple startups, so this is, you've kind of gone through this process a bunch, a lot. Um, what are some immediate inefficiencies with the communication that, that you notice? And what are some ways that um, somebody can resolve them starting, you know, in a new role? Um, I think one of the most simplest is uh, communicating what you're doing. And I think that, you know, we all have our own ways of doing that, whether that be through a updated Trello board or, or project management software whether that's posting updates on a Slack group or sending emails out to every member. And I think what works for us and what's worked in previous companies doesn't necessarily work for future roles. So I think it's important to understand what, uh, what works in the company. And even if it's inefficient, like adapting to the existing process and then coming up with ideas on how to improve that flow of communication and getting things done. Um, I would argue that a significant portion of my time consulting for businesses uh, actually envelops speaking to the businesses about how things are done and how we can improve them. And mm -hmm. even if this is like not related to marketing, this process has just saved us so much headache in, um, in, in getting stuff done, achieving our deliverables. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's really an invaluable process. There's a great uh, book. Go ahead. Sorry, just uh, stick this one in. It's a great book that I read, uh, recommended by a psychologist friend called Nonviolent Communication. And actually it's a really great book on uh, communicating and it, and it has a framework which you can use. And although it's not directly related to um, marketing in itself, I think it, it's, it's really valuable for anyone in, well, pretty much any role involving lots of heavy communication. I think specifically, and any organization is going to have their inefficiencies with, with communication and, and process, but one of the unique challenges to, to startups, specifically in scale mode, is just like things are moving so fast and there is a lot of, um, I guess what you could say, like blind sides, right? Like, like there, because one person might be uh, thinking about making a key hire, one people one person might be making a specific change and there might not be transparency. Um, there's a lot of kind of like, like blind spots um, for each individual into like how the company is growing and changing. Definitely. Um, I 100% I agree. And that's why I like to set up uh, data studio dashboards that are accessible by everyone because I think getting buy-in from everyone is so important. And when everyone can access data to understand their contribution to the larger business and marketing goals, um, they feel more empowered and more excited to, um, to achieve these things. For sure. Um, the second thing you talked about in the, in the first week, and this is probably, this is, is tooling, right? Um, so, so basically what tools are, are different people in the, in the organization using? Um, I think this is something that, that you actually revisit later in the article. Um, and I think it's important because, you know, I've been at start, I've been at a few startups as well. Um, one of the, one of the things that, that I see is that there's a lot of times there are immediate issues that come from like measurement reporting, um, where data is accessed. And so to kind of look at that and, and think about that in the first week, 
um, and develop some sort of like roadmap for how can we actually fix some of these things. I, th I think it's really smart that, that you did that so immediately. Yeah, and this has come from uh, my experience having to unstick situations where they've been using outdated tooling or the data accuracy hasn't been very good. Uh, and this is really important to look at really early on because as you create your growth models, as you create your marketing frameworks, if um, the data that you're basing it from these tools is is wrong, then your your campaigns are going to be off. And that's why it's so important to like do these fundamental semi-boring things at the beginning. Right, right. And and not even and not to be so overwhelmed about everything else that's happening, kind of starting with the simple things first, because at the end of this first week, um, if you've done your work, you'll you'd have a more holistic sense of kind of how people how people work, um, what the people that you're working with kind of care about and what they're they're struggling with. And then like some immediate kind of quick fixes um, to make to tooling. And I think that's important, you know, for for anybody in a role, like you're coming into you're you're being hired and you know you want to add value to an organization and getting those quick wins and um, you know making sure that your manager, your team uh, kind of sees that you're thinking about these things and caring about these things. I think it, it goes a long way in kind of developing that relationship over time as well. And also, it also serves to show value um, within a early period of days to get buy-in from people as well. For sure. Um, cool. So that's the, that's the first week. And then you kind of talk about the, the first month. And this is a, a little bit longer, like you've, you know, within the, within the first four weeks, um, there's a lot of things you can get done. Um, I do like the, the flow that you kind of talk about. You kind of, you kind of start with customer research um, and then move into kind of KPIs and, and metrics. Um, I think this is so fundamental, specifically being in as a growth marketer, before you've even thought about what our KPIs are um, and what your growth goals are, you've already started to identify communication style, you've identified kind of discrepancies in, in tooling, and then you're going through the, the customer research. I know that in the article you mentioned kind of going through existing customer data um, and, and stuff that the, the company might have, um, what recommendations would you have for somebody maybe before they're even in that stage of they're in the company or if they're just kind of like doing customer research um what are some tools or tactics or tips you have for for doing really good customer research um i think researching jobs to be done um if you don't know it already and really like understanding the model and the framework and how it applies to your company is a invaluable tool uh, it's definitely helped me um, understanding the fundamental ideas behind customer research and not just creating a lot of data and then not actioning it. Um, always thinking about how this data applies to your company and what, uh, what decision, decisions it affects and what changes you can make from it. Um, I think focusing on the fundamentals will help immensely. So um, that's interesting. Like, do you think that a lot of people spend time doing customer research and like just take maybe taking down information or they're not actually focusing on the right things? Yeah, I think a lot of people create basic customer personas based off like um, their own biases, maybe stick it on a wall and then forget about it. It's an evolving process. It's an evolving document that should always be data first. Um, and it should always be present whenever you're making business decisions, marketing decisions, um, yeah, just focusing on making sure the, the data quality is accurate and what differences you're going to make in your company because of it. Um, what are some, where are some places that you're actually looking for, for customer data, whether that be, you know, different, different internal tools or maybe even like external data customer reviews? Um, would love to hear about that. <clears throat> I mean, the, the place depending on the type of data you're looking for, depends on the source of where you're gonna get that information. Um, the best place generally is internal 
data storage. Um, if you know SQL, going into the database and trying to understand as much as you can um, for more sort of like basic startups using Google Analytics. Uh, be cautious of the demographics functionality there. I find that it doesn't always line up perfectly, but it can provide some information. And I also think the most important uh, method, if possible, is speaking to customers. Uh, if you're selling enterprise software, this might be a bit difficult, but if you're speaking to startups and small businesses, um, getting them on the phone, if possible, meeting them in person, asking them tons of questions, because this is where the most valuable data I've gathered for any of my most successful marketing campaigns have come from. And it's rarely the highly thought out surveys I've used, but more as the conversation continues, finding areas that I didn't think about mm. um, and asking questions through that. An example of this was I took a customer for lunch in London at a few startups ago. And um, as part of our conversation, I asked, uh, how would you describe our company to a friend in like one line? And uh, he, I forget the exact phrase the customer used, but it was something like e-commerce and one line of code. Um, <laughs> and when I got back to the office, I duplicated a, a Google Ads campaign, just tried it out. And uh, it resulted in a massive CTR, a much higher CTR and uh, conversion rate. And it's only through that sort of casual conversation was I able right. to get that data and those other kinds of insights, which have led to like better performing ad campaigns or like content marketing campaigns. Sure. And I mean, uh, just to review, like we're, we're still in the, the first month. We haven't even created a campaign. We haven't written copy. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't really looked at any of that stuff um yet and so now it's like the the more time that you're spending in that deep customer research when you're when you're writing that camp writing that copy for the campaign for the first time or maybe reviewing ad creative you're then you're then in your mind thinking about that conversation that that you had um and i think that's so important like i've i've ran a lot of different ad campaigns without talking to customers um, and sometimes you, you have your own idea and your own kind of romantic version of what you think your company is and, and what you're doing, but, um, human beings, I mean, we, we all have our own opinions. And so like what your customer thinks, uh, your company does and what your company actually does, if there's a disconnect there, it, it's good to kind of identify that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so you talk about tooling again and, and talking about uh, kind of like making a spreadsheet and there's really helpful in the ar article for, for folks that are listening. Um, there's kind of a tool, tools issue template you use. And then um, we go and go into the first 90 days, right? The, the, the first quarter. Um, and this is where we get more specific into kind of setting up, uh, building a, a growth culture, looking at reporting, um, building up an experimentation plan. Um, and I think that, you know, depending on what startup you're at, uh, many companies have different ways for reporting and, and updating on performance. But for anybody starting a career, like being able to um, impact uh, metrics or data within that first quarter to be able to show the, the changes that you're, that you're making, I think is super important. Um, but also when you talk about kind of creating a, a growth culture, um, would love to, would love to hear about how you think about that too, because, you know, different, every startup is a little bit different in terms of their culture around growth. Um, but you actually talk about like communicating with folks and understanding how they think about growth. And then that kind of goes into building that culture as well. Yeah, so growth culture is something that I'm very passionate about. Um, culture is arguably the most difficult thing to change in a startup because people are, that's what people most emotionally feel comfortable with. Um, I feel that everyone in a startup, particularly early stage, um, merely by definition of being a startup, is involved in the growth process. And I, I have my own sort of perspective on it, but each one should be slightly more unique or, or like personalized. Uh, adapting to what people already do, introducing some new ideas and constantly refining on the process is the aim of the game. Um, but it is a really difficult process. And if you don't listen to people before trying to make changes, then um, it, it won't work. 
So that's why it's so important to understand what other people's perspectives on growth are, understand what their processes, systems, and like mindset is towards it, mm -hmm. and then try and either nudge them in the right direction or um, adapt your own perspective. This also moves into thinking about how different stakeholders stakeholders have different KPIs and different performance metric, metrics that they're they're kind of beholden to, right? And something I've seen in you know B two B specifically is a lot of times a misalignment of incentives. Um, just like a simple example, you know, if you have an enterprise sales team, you have an SDR, uh, more like an enterprise seller and account manager. The SDR is going to try to get you as many leads as possible. The seller is going to try to sell as many of those leads as possible. The account manager wants to upgrade them, but um, the SDR might be getting uh, shitty leads, right? The the salesperson might be closing people and not and and closing people that might later churn. And then the account manager is like, "What's going on here? You're getting me. You're setting the wrong expectations." Um, so when you're kind of going through that process and talking to different folks and understanding like what their different KPIs are, um, is there ever a time that you're thinking about like, okay, maybe we have to make some, some changes here. Maybe these within the first kind of 90 days, like, are you, are you thinking about like, this might be the wrong performance metric to, to be going for right now? Yeah, definitely. I think there's industry standards, um, which you know, generally apply to most businesses um, with a few secondary KPIs or OKRs, depending on like their particular customer base uh, and business objectives. Um, I, I think understanding what everyone is working towards and understanding your relationship to those KPIs is super important. Um, but I am also the kind of person that will go in and be like, okay, this is wrong. We need to like, change <laughs> this, this and this. Um, um, without consulting people as much as I should, um, purely because I'm so sort of enthusiastic about making sure the, the data is right before um, making any campaigns. Because I think if you do, if you change your KPIs after the campaigns, you're moving the goalposts. And sure. um, that's, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating thing to do. And it's, it's definitely happened to me a few times. It's, it's definitely happened to me as well. Um, and that, and it comes down to expectations, right? It's, and, you know, I've been, I've been at startups where um, I was the most advanced performance marketer. And so that expectation, um, I was the one that had the most context into what we could realistically hit. And if the metrics are off or the expectations of the um, executive team is off, then you're not actually able to perform and you're not meeting those expectations. Um, so I, I really think that's important. The last part, I know we're, you know, we have a, a few minutes left. Uh, we're going over time. Do you have like another five minutes, by the way, Dan? Is that okay? Sure. Cool. Um, the last part, and we could do like hours on, on this, this next part, is the growth marketing experimentation plan. Um, and this is one of my favorite parts of being a growth marketer and, and working on the marketing side versus sales side specifically is the idea of constant testing, constant iteration, um, very data driven um, actions that will lead to growing an organization, as well as just thinking about like shorter term wins. Um, specifically, like it, what's going on in the world right now, um, you know, things change quick. And like planning, you can have a very long-term view on, on things, um, but you have to understand that like things are going to change and you have to be able to react. And um, it's like working in, in growth marketing and startups, you see this constant iteration and, and this cyclical way of, of experimentation. Um, and I think that's so cool. Uh, I did the Reforge growth series last year. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Reforge. Um, I am. But super great content like um, amazing top of the industry yeah uh I, and it's funny like it's it's a bit expensive to go through the growth series i think it was like 3500 bucks and i was thinking to myself you know should i should i spend this so happy that i did um but there's a there's a few different ways to think about growth and like in in reforge they talk more about thinking of of growth as as kind of loops and not funnels 
Um, and then there's kind of the, the David McClure, like pirate, uh, pirate metrics framework. Um, and I'd love to think about, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on how you think about growth, how you think about these, these two different things, and then how that builds into like an experimentation plan. Um, and that, and that, I think that's a good way to, to kind of wrap things up and, and end your first 90 days as a growth marketer. <coughs> So I think um, early stage growth for a lot of startups is basically a lot of educated guessing and testing. Um, and it's important to have, it's important to test these things quite scientifically in order to minimize the amount of guessing and to maximize the amount of uh, accuracy uh, from the experiments. And you, once you've sort of mastered that process or at least understood how it works and are able to execute it efficiently, um, thinking about the whole user journey is, is really sort of something a good growth marketer is thinking about on a daily basis. The whole, whole process of growth is, is just a system. It's, um, I always used to think it was like marketing campaigns, sort of like Mad Men, but everything is based off data. Everything is based off research. There is, uh, processes and tools and systems for pretty much every sort of component. And um, <clears throat> as a marketer nowadays, what I try and do is optimize my understanding and learnings of uh, those different systems and tools, um, which basically sort of join together like Lego bricks to form good customer acquisition. Yeah, I think um, thinking about the, the customer journey, and it's one thing we mentioned be before starting this car call, we were talking a little, about, a little bit about retargeting and how um, useful that can be for for a lot of businesses um, breaking that customer journey down and then really understanding developing an experimentation framework around like hitting specific points um, I think is super import important I and you know for people again listening um, if you want to check out Dan's experimentation plan he links it in that growth mentor um, article that that I'll link in the article and it goes through there's there's a, a long list of of kind of um, experiments that that you can think about running um, I guess my my final question when when you think about experimentation um, is around prioritization so uh, how do you think how do you I know that you you talk about the the ice method a little bit um, but really high level like you're doing all, you're doing a bunch of customer research. Um, you're kind of looking at KPIs and, and um, talking with, with different folks. Um, when you kind of come up with all the experiments, how do you prioritize them and, and how do you kind of go through that process? So in the framework, I use a very simple model called the ICE framework, uh, which is impact, confidence, ease. And that's essentially rating each uh, experiment based on how likely you believe it will be to succeed, how difficult is it to implement, um, and how confident are you in your assumptions. Um, that's good for a beginner. Um, I would love to say that I was super data orientated in my prioritization models now, but it's more, um, it is a combination of like that ICE model, prediction models, and also gut. Um, mm. I kind of have a good assumption of what to do next and what's going to result in the biggest impact. Um, and I think that's just come from experience, um, but I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a better process for it somewhere out there. Cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, with all this, you can be as, as data driven as, as possible, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty early in my growth marketing career. I'd say um, my goal is one day to be like a, a head of growth and, and to work my way up. And just as an, a little aside, I told you I started my career in sales and, um, you know, I saw like working my way up there would be like into a VP of sales role or something like that. I really love being part of, of the growth side. Um, and I, I think it's so important, like just that little experience you get because you can run the experiments and you can develop this framework. Um, but you're, once you're getting more base hits and once you're, you're getting that more experience, you just kind of like intuitively can sense what things may work and, and where to, to focus next. It's actually why I was very particular about choosing the next company I, I, I worked for. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I took a little bit of a pay cut, um, but it was so that I could join a, a more advanced team 
and scale my growth that way. And I think it's a good recommendation for anybody thinking about, you know, a new career. Like if you're listening to this interview, you might be thinking about getting a, a new job. It's like making that decision um, to take something for the experience more so than, than the salary, depending on where you're at in your career. Um, and I'm super confident that, that that's probably the, the good choice to make a lot of the times. Yeah, really great summary. Cool. Uh, well, Dan, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to chat. Um, any closing thoughts? Um, just keep focusing on the, the systems and your sort of fundamental, who is your customer and what problem are you solving for them? I think as long as we, we always focus on that, the basics, then it should be, you know, everything else builds from that. For sure. Awesome. Well, have a, have a great day and, uh, and stay safe in the meantime, Dan. Cheers. You too. Bye.